Uh, Judy Fox works with co-curator Ginger Duggan under the moniker C2 Curator Squared. They develop exhibitions of cross-media contemporary art and design that explore current issues and culture. They formed this partnership in 2008. With an undergraduate degree from Bryn Mawr College and a graduate degree from the University of Minnesota, Judy trained at the Walker Art Center. She's also been a curator at the Davis Museum and Cultural Center at Wellesley College, where she worked with Nancy Holt on the sculpture Wild Spot. She's also worked at the RISD Museum, the ICA Boston, among many other venues. Uh, her work with uh, Curators Squared has toured widely to both academic and public museums. The collaborative writing of the collaborative has been published internationally. The Association of Art Museum Curators has recognized their exhibitions with awards. And the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Elizabeth Stone Graham Foundation have also supported their work. It is my great pleasure and honor to bring Judy Fox up to the stage to talk about Wild Spot. Welcome, Judy. It was 1979. I was the curator at the Davis Museum and Cultural Center, formerly the Wellesley College Museum, and all I knew about the Wellesley campi campus was that it consistently ranked highly, is this okay? Okay, great. That it consistently ranked highly in the US News and World Report's closely watched annual score sheet. I was hungry to invite artists to respond to this manicured 400 acres with lakes, ponds, streams, conifer stands, hillocks, and rolling lawns. Site-specific was, work was, to me, the most interesting art being made then. That opportunity came when six museums around Boston joined together to simultaneously present exhibitions that summed up the 1970s, and I jumped right in to initiate and organize site work. My plan was to invite four artists to campus to create work that responded to the landscape. Each artist had a different, distinct approach. Stephen Antonakis enhanced the Paul Rudolph Jew Art Center with neon, and Ned Smythe brought to campus the vocabulary of pattern and decoration. Robert Irwin's filigreed steel, steel line for Wellesley College became part of the museum's collection at the start. The Smythe and Antonakis works were dismantled as planned at the end of the exhibition. And Nancy Holt's Wild Spot was the fourth work that comprised the site work exhibition. It has been on the campus since then and is currently changing status from being on loan to the college from Nancy and subsequently the foundation from its six foot 10 inch height to encircle an inner circle that measures eight feet high with a diameter of five feet. The outer ring has an opening at its lowest point so that a viewer might enter and walk around the inner ring, the interior of which is planted with indigenous flowering perennials. These elements were fabricated over the winter in Somerville, Massachusetts. And Nancy returned in early spring to oversee the installation. She had worked with Del Nickerson at the, muse at the college's Ferguson greenhouses to come up with the list of flowering plants to be planted within the core of the work. This configuration of ringed fencing is loaded with conflicting messages. It invites, yet rebuffs. It protects, yet imprisons. The natural contrasts with unnatural, wild versus tamed. The viewer is invited in to, to view the inner garden, yet is kept from entering it. The wildflowers bloom and grow but are restrained by their cage. I'm not sure that Nancy was thinking about or even knew about how apt this configuration was for the Wellesley campus, which is the amalgamation of some seven farms whose land was sculpted, drained, and planted according to the notions of picturesque garden design expressed in Frederick Law Olmsted Jr.'s analysis of the campus, put forth in an eloquent letter of 1902 
to the president of the college, Caroline Hazard. The 900-foot serpentine brook that runs along behind Wild Spot originated in an electric pumped miniature waterfall on the north slope. This water element was completely inappropriate to the indigenous sandy gravelly topography and the meandering stream that culminates in a large pond failed several times until a concrete bed for the brook, pools, and pond was built. This was hardly a natural place. Early photographs show long meadow grasses in this area. It was the invention of the lawnmower a decade earlier and embraced by the college in the 1930s that homogenized the campus, blurring the distinctions between lawn and meadows, resulting in the golf green suburbanized campus that Nancy found, still the treatment in the late 1970s. So the idea of completely constructed the idea of a completely constructed landscape, according to an ideal quite foreign to the actual site, English parkland transported to New England farmland, was echoed in this highly structured enclosed garden of native plants that Nancy created. The planned profusion of flowering wild flowers burgeoning with the inner ring spoke of these contrasts that Nancy was probably not specifically aware of. What Nancy may have been alluding to was the rarefied hothouse sense in both Wild Spot and in the idea of a pastoral college campus away from daily activities. Campuses, especially here in New England, but not right here where we are today, are often surrounded by fences, as in these views of Harvard Yard on the right and Tufts University on the left. Within these boundaries, the life of the mind can run wild, in a sense. If the X axis is the Wellesley campus and the Y axis is the trajectory of Nancy Holt's work, Wild Spot is their point of intersection. She had only just completed stone enclosure rock rings in Bellingham with its concentric circles, which she brought. She brought this form of, of nesting circles, altered in scale and material and configuration from the west to the east coast. Wild Spot is one of four works created nearly in succession that Holt designed using iron fencing, actually welded hot rolled steel bars, painted flat black, three of which were realized. Her interest in this material might have begun with the steel rebar cages fabricated to strengthen the concrete culverts in sun tunnels. If we go back earlier, Holt's locator works beginning in 1971-72, first indoors in New York City, and then on a ranch in Missoula, Montana, we find black steel pipes that are both sculptural elements in themselves and serve as viewfinders, both roles played by the bars in the fencing in Wild Spot and the three related works. The parade of vertical straight or curving bars fit into the vocabulary of the day as using industrial materials in repeated patterns was the prevalent language and form of minimalism, another dominant direction in art making then, as we can see in the work of her contemporaries, all working this way in the 70s and 80s. Donald Judd, Walter Di Maria, Carl Andre, for example. For Inside Out in Washington, DC, we see a model here. An annual ring in Saginaw, Michigan, Holt designed domes a la bird cages made of iron bar with circular openings. They dwarf Wild Spot. Annual ring has a diameter of 30 feet, and both are located in public spaces. They are more about formal issues than the kind of intimate dialogue Wild Spot suggests. They refer to the neoclassical architecture of Washington, DC, in the case of Inside Out, and to the solar power of the government building that Annual Ring celebrates. Auriga is the fourth work in which black iron fencing was the defining material. For this unbuilt proposal for Harvard Square, of which there are no images or drawings extant, Holt introduced the essence of parkland into the busy intersection of Brattle Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The fencing, but this time with a swooping height, grass, water, and seating brought the traditional elements that define park into the heart of Cambridge traffic. 
Wild Spot also fits into another sort of trajectory of Holt's work. We've seen her use of oculi as framing devices from the locator, sun tunnels, stone enclosure, and inside out. The circular openings that pierce the walls of these works are means to focus the attention of the viewer looking out, as in a viewfinder, as well as enabling a means to focus light and create shadow as the earth revolves around the sun. Just following Wild Spot, Nancy created Time Span in 1981 for the Laguna Gloria estate, part of the Austin Contemporary Museum in Texas. Here the iron bars have become sectioned circles, part of a narrative by means of the biomorphic form of the supporting stucco, suggesting the adobe of indigenous building types. The wrought iron, instead of being the framing edge, fills in the circular openings, as do the grates in the windows of southwestern and Mexican homes. Their configuration also suggests crosshairs or targets. As in all these works, there is the dual foci of looking in and looking out, supporting both the view and the viewer, protecting and exposing the shifting dynamic between viewer and viewed, between subject and object. But let's return to Wild Spot. Nancy, whose family was from Massachusetts, had last heard from Wellesley College when they sent her a disheartening rejection letter. Her mother's first choice college for her had turned her away. So to be invited back to be commissioned by that same institution several decades later to create a work for the campus had to be quite satisfying, some kind of vindication. She talked quite a bit about this. I don't recall Nancy seriously considering any other site on campus once we walked up into the Alexandra Botanic Gardens. A month ago, I visited Wild Spot at Wellesley College for the first time in many years. The campus landscape has changed since I'd left my position of curator there 20 years ago. It was landscape architect Michael Van Valkenburg's 1997 reevaluation in campus plan that instigated the return of meadows in the place of drained and manicured lawns, a decision with both historical and environmental motivations. Now the meadow has returned to the botanical gardens, and a mowed swath loosely defines a path through the grasses. I found my reaction to Wild Spot quite different from how I had thought of it during the first half of its life. Then it sat on a vast grassy manicured expanse. The tangle within its circle was in stark contrast. Now the meadow comes nearly up to its parameters. With these shifts, the meanings and forms of Wild Spot, I'm sorry, with these shifts, the meanings and form of Wild Spot have shifted. The concentric circles have proliferated like rings spreading in a pond, with a new ring added by the foot traffic around the outside. Is Wild Spot now the entire botanic garden instead of the small planted indigenous garden within the inner ring? Did Wild Spot instigate this return to the original rendering of the landscape from golf course to countryside? This work functions in the way that for me defines the most interesting art. Its form is the catalyst for a number of readings and these accrue shift and change through time. The artist has set in motion a dynamic dialogue with between the work and its setting, just as site-specific work is intended. And as that setting inevitably changes character through the decades, the work reveals new ways to understand the world around it. And I'll close there. Right. Mm -hmm.